Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Robbins, and I'm here with John Paul Maxfield to discuss systems thinking today. Um, I would love it if we had a chat window and people could ask questions live and if we could hear where people are from and who's watching. Unfortunately, the streaming software that I'm using doesn't yet integrate with LinkedIn's chat. So <laughs> we're going to have to just do this today as a presentation. And I, everything in life is a work in progress. Welcome, John Paul. It is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Nice. I'll take that. So tell me, um, one of the things about this this live stream is that we started with my, my having hypothesized a different topic, and you very much wanted to talk about systems thinking. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up having systems thinking being an important part of who you are and what you do? Sure. So... Uh, Again, I think you introduced it, but my name is John Paul Maxfield. And um, I think living systems is what I would put sort of um, beyond that or sort of at the start of that. Um, and it's interesting what you said that I just want to hold on to is uh, it, it's a work in progress, a work in process. That's a really uh, interesting thought to sort of come back to. But um, I uh, have always been sort of um i guess uh hesitant to accept knowledge um and always uh you know move towards testing and, and sort of under understanding and deepening my understanding um and in a worldview or or sort of a way of you know being in the world that uh really gravitates towards you know experts telling you how it is uh through education systems through business systems through you know maybe religious systems or whatever it happens to be uh there's not this i think what i see as a as a, a, a an innate part of humanness which is to continue to develop and deepen understanding um, and then be able to, you know, through that understanding, actually make effect or, or uh, affect systems and move things in new ways. So I started, I think um, entrepreneurship was something I sort of fell into. So I started a company 12 years ago called Waste Farmers, which was about, you um, developing people, businesses, and brands who transform emerging and social environmental needs into market-based opportunities. And so, so an entrepreneur hat. Okay, so the entrepreneur hat, uh, and you talk about it, it, it takes, takes, it sounds like living systems opportunities, turns them into market-based opportunities. Uh, it's like, you know, um, I think, that idea that you that we kind of rooted in was this idea of process, and through that, there's transforming of of, of let's call them energies or transforming of things, um, and so entrepreneurship and really businesses are this very powerful um, uh, these very powerful kind of entities to move the world. Um, and they can move it in ways that are beneficial and move it in ways that aren't so beneficial, right? And I think what we're faced with today is we need business moving in a way that's beneficial really quickly. Sure, so so let's, let's tie this specifically to living systems and, yes. to, and to systems thinking. Yep. So I certainly know that one of the criticisms of a lot of business is that it's short-sighted and that it goes after immediate profits at the expense of perhaps the larger common good. And I think a lot of times when people talk about systems, especially living systems and their relationship to business, a lot of the conversation that I hear, and let's face it, I hang out with, you know, with environmentalist uh, uh, type people. So I'm gonna hear this kind of conversation, but a lot of what I hear is, ooh, businesses muck with living systems. Businesses actually screw up living systems but you are trying to integrate the two and have businesses help living systems. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What is it about your approach that's different from 
uh, you know, that's different from somebody who basically is just out to exploit everything they can. You know, I'll use Coca-Cola as an example, right? The single largest plastic polluter on the planet. They've, you know, probably single-handedly responsible for a big chunk of that hundred mile wide whirlpool of plastic you know, that's sitting in the middle of the Pacific. How are you and what you do different from a Coca-Cola? Um, so I think, um, how we, how, like, how is my different Coca-Cola? I think um, this idea of apparently good or bad is, is is a difficult sort of thing to, to I guess, judge. So I'm, I won't do that. But I think that, like, um, where, where it's different is, you know, m m mine is rooted from a place of seeing the world as alive, uh, which is, you know, a premise held by, you know, indigenous people and, and Eastern mystics. And now quantum physics is sort of evolving to say, or, or is illustrating like the world is actually alive. It's living. There are, it, it, there's living systems. And so um, this, you know, where, where businesses, I think, um, end up doing harm is because they're basing the way that they do work or how they do work on knowledge systems that are inherently incomplete and therefore deliver uh, results that are counter what they intend to do. My belief is that, you know, I don't believe humans are, are um, bad or destroying, like we're part of living systems, we're part of natural systems. And we have roles to play within those natural systems. Uh, it's just that we've got to develop the ability to play those roles to have a meaningful contribution, and we and we need to. Um, it's critical that we do at this point, and businesses can play an important role of developing that within the people in the organization, within their customers, and, and so on. And again, that's not something that is, you know, radically new, right? Like again, indigenous people, Eastern. So now quantum so, tell me, so tell me then about your business, because you said that you actually started businesses with this perspective and the perspective. Yeah, yeah. So tell me then how do you know, what did you do? What did you do differently? How did you inculcate this type of awareness, and this type of thinking into running a business? Yeah. So I think, you know, I started off with, you know, an intention uh, and that was to actually make the world a better place. Like I wanted to do good. And so I actually ended up adopting a great many things that actually made no sense and took me farther away from that. Then number two is- so, wait, so, for, so for example, what, what did you adopt that was taking so you away? For example, um, you know, metrics-based monitoring systems, right? Based on like KPIs and uh, OKRs and so forth. Like a, a good way to sort of frame this is to think about like, hold this and we're gonna work well, I said, we're going to work this. Well, we're going to work this way on your screen. Like we started action, right? And m move to the, the results and the effects. But seldom do we move up and sort of move into to the thoughts, which are just recycled things and actually thinking in a moment and then move up to the subjects we're thinking about and then thinking about how we're thinking. But that thinking about how we're thinking is actually a very important and powerful step because in that we might discover something new. Okay. On, so then focusing on all of these, you know, um, results or all of these, you know, KPIs and they haven't been considered in the context of a whole. So they're actually taking me farther and farther away or taking the business farther and farther away from what it's actually trying to do. So in your business then, it sounds like what you did was not just focus on whatever the, the results were, um, but you were focusing on the thinking that was getting you to those results. And what you discovered in that thinking was that using things like KPIs were actually causing you to do the wrong things? They were just having us focus on the wrong place. Like if you look at a system, a business is, it's actually, you know, like Carol Sanford and her work did a good job, picture a star, it's customers, then co-creators, which is all of the, you know, employees and supply chain and so forth that go into, you know, making the product and then the earth, 
which is where the raw materials come from and end up going, communities and, and investors. So that is a business as a system. Um, yep. And so, you know, by sort of thinking about it in those terms, it starts to shift uh, perspective, it starts to shift what's possible. So it, it almost sounds like it almost sounds like what you're doing is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll call it multi-stakeholder analysis to use a current a current common buzzword, but you're actually considering the planet and the other living things on the planet to be part of the stakeholders. Is that would that be an accurate way of putting it? But it's also, I think that's a, that. Uh, um, I'm not sure if it's accurate or not, but let me say that like I think there's knowledge, okay. And knowledge is really easily communicatable, right? Like it's, but then understanding, this is what we're getting at. And like um, understanding is not something that's easily communicatable. Understanding has to be embodied, right? Mm -hmm. But it's that understanding that drives will to do something, which is what we, you know, we need. Like we have knowledge that the world needs to stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius, right? but we're still doing the same things that are actually going to increase and accelerate the rate at which that goes far beyond 1.5. And so yeah. why I say it's critical is how do we deepen understanding? You know? Well, that's, that, that's what you're here to tell us. <laughs> I certainly can't tell. I certainly can, like, that's the, that's the trick. And I'm not being obtuse, you know, um, but I guess what, I, what I'm getting at is you're a marketer. This is what I was thinking about. You're like, you're very good at marketing. Do something for me. Describe uh, a customer the way that marketing describes a customer. Well, I mean, if you're referring to like demographic marketing, uh, it would be something like uh, I don't know, middle age, middle uh, middle age man between forty and fifty five who uh, lives in a suburban area, works nine to five at a job, you know, at a middle management job. That might be that might be a market. Um. What does that do for you? How, like, just in, like explaining a customer like that. What does that elicit for you? It, well, it basically it it lets me make decisions about how I'm going to market and what I'm and what I'm going to market. Because to somebody, I'm going to make the assumption that if I describe someone that way, that everyone who fits that description, right? And that's a, that's a broad description that encompasses millions and millions of people. Uh, I can make the assumption that all of those people will have the same buying patterns, that they'll want the same things, that they'll be willing to pay similar prices. So it's in some sense a shorthand for me being able to do, for me being able to treat millions of people as one for purposes of both what I actually do in my business and then also how I think about them. So right in my mind, when I'm in marketer mode and if that's the demographic, and if I'm thinking demographically and that's the demographic, then in some sense, I'm treating all of those people as interchangeable. So um, what I'll ask is just, you know, for you to test later, but is, is a premise that I hold is that every being, everything living is unique. It has its own pattern that's seeking to be brought into the world. And what I'll offer is I believe that's imperative for the world to evolve. And so if you were to hold one by name, that you sell to can you describe you don't have to name them you can use a different name a pseudonym but hold it in your mind hold him or her in your mind got it so just to, like you know and sort of image them alive and living their initials are jpm <laughs> male wearing a blue shirt i i've got a very very vivid mental picture of that person but beyond the picture picture me alive and moving and what am i seeking to 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 bring to the world and you what don't you have to it's sort of like it's not a concrete thing, but can you picture me alive and moving in your mind? To some degree, I mean, yeah, I you know I don't it so right since I don't actually know what you're thinking, I can have some hypotheses about it. So I can have some hypotheses that that one of the things, and I'm actually going to move away from thinking of you as a specific, but I'm going to think of you know George who fits the earlier description. That, that I gave, you know, one of the things George wants, for example, is security for his family. Uh, George may also want to get a promotion at work because George wants a certain amount of status. Um, 
you know, George plays in a garage band on weekends and really wants to express himself artistically. So those are those are some of the kinds of things that come to mind. So then what is it that you uniquely bring to him to help him do those things? And and again, you don't have to answer that, but like um, actually do if you if 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 you want to. Well, you're really wait. I'm supposed to be putting you on the spot here. You're putting me on the spot. No, I don't want it. So I definitely <laughs> the last thing I want to do is put you on the spot. But what I'm getting at is now, like if you, I'll speak for me. When I hold that specific entity, all of a sudden it changes my understanding and it brings them alive in my mind. And it allows me, I think, in that sense, to actually truly be innovative and bring something new. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I'm 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 reaching for my inner innovator here, and my inner my inner innovator is saying, "You've never even lived in the suburbs. What in the world could you possibly bring to George?" Right. But but of course, part of what I'm thinking is, well, I never have lived in the suburbs. So one of the things that I bring to George is a completely different perspective. As long as I can figure out how to match, as long as I can figure out enough about what George needs, and obviously listening to George is probably a great place to start, uh, that I bring a completely different tool set than George has. So on one hand, that means I don't have the understanding to be able to solve George's problems innately. But on the other hand, it means I'm coming from such a different perspective that I also don't have George's blind spots. And hopefully somewhere in the middle there is something that I can bring to George and help George out with. And you can bring something new that only you can uniquely do. And I think the same can be said for businesses, right? And I think that the same can be said for humanity and, and, and civilization. Like we have to bring in and generate new patterns because the one that we that we're following is accelerating at a rate that's going to, um, well, the I don't, like I don't want to go down that path, but like one way to sort of um, consider it or, or what I'm driving at is, um, you know, think about well, uh, uh, Carol is a, you know someone who's very good at sort of educating how to think. Uh, or build a capability to think in living systems or, or to um, think different, to borrow uh, Apple's marketing, you know, slogan. But she tells a story of a, um, the, a chancellor at her daughter's school who was recounting um, how when he was in the Peace Corps, he was tasked with teaching science to, uh, you know, young children. And so he brought this Western view. It came to the point where you probably remember this, where we're going to get knowledge of, of frogs by killing them and dissecting them. And I, so, I, re I remember that very well. I, right. I was responsible for at least one frog passing. Right. It's, it's, it's uh, very traumatic. Yeah. But like, um, so he tells the story of, you know, he's getting ready to do this and the kids are all holding their frogs and uh he's like okay now we're going to kill them and these kids all started screaming and you know the village shaman came running in and this is probably you know some artistic license and, and over drama but to drive home like he's like what are you doing he's like well we're going to understand uh, the frog by killing it and dissecting it and the shaman was like oh my god stop what are you doing he's like put the frogs down children get down, start hopping. And so they hop around and then they went and found like frog food. And then they, you know, they all started laughing and their, and their, you know, energy changed. And when he was done, you know, the shaman was like, that's how you understand a frog, not the way you did. And what he was saying, and, and then the frogs, you know, sort of hopped out. But I think that like, we can't sit and dissect everything in the world. Right, because we'll never be able to find, you know, complete meaning. But I think we can find patterns, and then hopefully, you know, through that, generate new ones or or innovate. And so that's where living systems thinking, sort of, you know, uh, as a capability, starts to um, develop that. And there's countless examples of the benefit of that in in business. Um, there's work in, you know. Uh, Procter and Gamble uh, work in, in DuPont work with seventh generation that really has elevated, uh, you know, uh, the growth and the trajectory of, of business. And through that, 
Um, so can, can you can you give, give some examples? Like how? What what is it that they've done that that isn't really out of the old model, but that's in the new model? So um, I think what they've done is I think we have this when we think about knowledge as external from experts, which I am certainly not one and I don't intend to be, like what I'm saying is understanding has to be embodied. Um, and it has well, so, experience. Well, like, well, like what is it that DuPont and these other companies have been doing? Like what's, so, well, what's, what's the different, you know, it's, I'm always curious because especially when you mentioned DuPont, right? I, I don't know if you followed, I think it was the C8 crisis where they had a 40 year cover up that, that uh, one of the chemicals that I guess is central to making Teflon turned out to be incredibly toxic and they were dumping it in the water supply of this one city or they were allegedly dumping in this water supply and they had this big lawsuit and there were cover-ups and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, when, when I, when I think of DuPont, I don't think, Oh, there's a company that really gets living systems and how they work. Um, Not across um, the board. I think that like in certain times, but like the, um, and that's the other aspect, like uh, this was more, um, I believe Colgate Palmolive and Procter and Gamble, but uh, a team went down and sort of built the capability for them to understand um, again, the essence of material in this case it was diatomaceous earth and how it moved through and became toothpaste and how they developed you know uh a uh, a more holistic view of their offering engaging people on the floor this is also during a period of time where um apartheid was just you know moving through and uh there was a kind of call to uh you know, increase the participation in the workforce of, of black Africans. And there was a deep embedded sense that like, you know, uh, there wasn't capability to do that because, uh, you know, uh, they could never understand, you know, uh, and there wasn't the knowledge base. But when this group came in, they were able to build the capability within the organization from people on the floor to people in management to really deeply understand the customer and deeply understand the material. And it became one of the best performing uh, manufacturing sites in all of the company. It won numerous awards from Nelson Mandela and so forth. But it's all to say that like, you know, um, everyone in the organization is the source of creativity uh, and the source of innovation. And when we develop systems that are top down uh, that are driven on knowledge or incomplete, uh, you know, um, incomplete understandings of things, we don't elicit that desire to be creative. And so um, it's about develop, it's about developing uh, people within the organization to build the capacity for innovation and, it, and, you know, sort of rooted in the things external to the organization that, that, that they're serving that are, um, that they're in a process of value exchange with. Got it. So now is, is this something you've also done in your own company or is this something that's in the direction that you're moving? Uh, so worked with Carol to build that capability within the organization. And what I want to do in, is now I'm moving to broadly look at the economy at large and the flow of capital into the economy. Like what, is really got my attention now is um you know the level of capital needed to transform the economy to net zero is just massive and how do we unlock that how do we move it how is capital moving now that's really where my flow is so climate finance is where i'm moving and and really excited about well so so tell me a little bit more about that, because one of the things that I have wondered, it's very clear that our entire civilization currently is, I don't like the machine metaphor particularly, but let's just say right now we are set up as a machine that is driving us inexorably towards, towards global warming, that is driving us inexorably towards taking as many raw materials as we can and essentially transferring them into landfill with a brief lifetime in the... Um, uh, uh, with, a, with a brief lifetime in the actual day-to-day -day economy. And I've wondered to some degree, because you say looking for capital uh, to put into this, 
what if it's that what if it's that very system that has somehow built within it all of this kind of collapse and danger that we're having i mean what if we actually need to abandon the idea of capital uh one of the things i've always thought about is imagine you're a small tribe living on a tropical island and there's a tsunami coming and you don't you don't all sit there dickering at least in my fantasy i've never lived in a small tribe on a tropical island but you're not going to all sit there dickering going like oh well you need to pay me this much money to help you move your 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 hut up to higher ground you all just pitch in and do what it takes to save as much as you can of all of the resources and it seems in fact i have a personal example from this um oh hang on a second let me there we go now we're, we're both back on the screen i have a personal example from this with hurricane katrina back in 2005 uh, I'm a graduate of Harvard Business School, and when Katrina had stranded all these people in the Superdome, I, and for some reason, no one was offering aid. I mean, George, this was one of those George W. Bush just totally fell down on this one. Um, and so I put out a call to the HBS Alumni Network, and I said, hey, anybody who has any contacts who can send food, who can send rescue, like, you know, we're supposedly the leaders, the leaders of the business community, let's lead. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is somebody had a fleet of trucks and his attitude was, sorry, you know, I don't know who's going to pay for the drivers and the gas and the trucks, so I can't send them to rescue people. And I just remember thinking, wow, this is a case where having an economic system and a monetary system is literally getting in the way of saving people's lives. And that was just kind of like ever since then, ever since that conversation, I've constantly been thinking it is very clear that capital enables huge things, right? Capital enables you to coordinate large numbers of people and point them in a direction. But it also, by pointing them in one direction, it keeps them from moving in another. And sometimes what you need is to move in another. So this has been a long and abstract way of saying, because we only have two and a half minutes left. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about, about uh, you know, climate capital and and what you envision as the next step that you'd be taking and where you'd be going next with trying to transform the economy into something that's, that's supportive of living systems rather than something that, that is erosive of them. Yeah, so I think that you touched on something that's really important. I agree that this machine as a metaphor view of the world is actually what's causing the issues that are, I guess, underlying uh, how we're acting in the world. And so if we can shift paradigms, right, we can shift how we're thinking and see the world the way it actually is, which is alive, it changes, you know, sort of the, the, the ways that, that we interact with it, and it changes what we see, and it changes the effects that we have. And so for me, I think a lot of it is going to be writing and understanding the systemic effects that have gotten us here, uh, and then um, kind of building the capability within an audience to understand how to discern and then, you know, moving towards hope. But, um, you know, uh, I want to be in, in moving towards this intersection of where capital is entering into systems, but it also has to be combined with developing that capacity in each, you know, individual to think like a tracker. Like, okay, so to, 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 like trackers will go and they'll track footprints, but they're also bringing that exercise that we did at the beginning to see potential. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's um, different levels of, of um, it's different levels. And so uh, each individual, I think the future is each individual playing the role uh, that they're here to play each, each living being, each living entity playing the role that they're here to play because Capitalism is not, you know, self-determination, you know, self-determining and self-directing is important. I think capitalism can foster that. But we have to develop the capability to actually play those roles. We don't need heroes. We need each of us, you know, contributing our unique aspect towards a common direction. Cool. Well, we are out of time. So if anyone wants to get a hold of you to talk about systems thinking, living systems, how how you're working with climate capital, how can they reach you? JP Maxfield at gmail.com. That's easy to remember. 
thank you very much for joining me, sir. And those of you uh, watching, thank you very much for watching. And uh, take care and go support your living systems because if you don't support your living systems, your living systems can't support you. Thank you.